tissue has in order to produce force and how that is regulated. We did mention about the size principle and the firing rate, which are the two main mechanisms by which we create or modulate the amount of force we produce. The size principle, just to refresh, goes from um, muscle uh, motor units are recruited in order of size, from smallest to largest, and the firing rate simply suggests that before the size of a motor unit is up, we increase the firing rate before we change to the next up in size motor unit. And it is by that mechanism that we modulate the amount of force that we need to produce. Which also means that when we intend to produce maximum force, there is a time delay from wanting it until that maximum force is attained. And we also have mentioned last week that that time in average is between 0.4 to 0.6 seconds. So average individuals, like most of us, will take between 0.4 to 0.6 seconds before we can produce maximum force. Um, but as you know, some tasks do take less than that. Uh, reason for which muscle pre-activation is very important. So that's essentially what we have covered. Uh, you can check more of this in your notes if you have, haven't been here last week. Today we are going to talk about um, some other modulation mechanisms that the muscle tissue has that enable it to produce more or less force. Uh, we will consider first of all the gross architectural features of muscles. Uh, we will also talk about the function and how that actually influences the way they behave. And we will also talk about the gross um, uh, structure of the muscle that in, in, indeed determines how, um, or how much force can be attained from a given muscle. So this is more or less what I want to achieve, whether we do it today or this week and next week. I don't know. We will see how we go. So first of all, let's just start off by talking about some basic concepts uh, of muscle function, purely from a biomechanical or mechanics perspective. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that muscles produce movement about joints. So if we consider that to be the center of a joint, and we think of a muscle being inserted at that point, the muscle produces force, in this case, in this direction. So if the muscle is contracted concentrically, it will produce the force that is depicted there. This force has two components. One force, one component that goes horizontal among the bone, or you might say shear component, and one that actually causes the motion. So that is what we call the effective. So the effective force is a component of this muscle force that actually produces or causes the uh, joint to rotate. So in this example, it will rotate that way. <coughs> Obviously, we would distinguish that here have an angle of insertion of the muscle. So the muscle angle insertion is the angle in between the muscle tissue and the bone it attaches.
this angle of insertion does change uh, depending on the joint angle. Does that make sense to you? So as the arm in this case moves, that angle of insertion will change. So when the joint flexes, the angle of insertion increases. When the joint stretches, that angle of insertion will decrease. Does that make sense to you? So if we have the same arrangement, we have that, say, stretch this way. If we calculate roughly that's the insertion point, the angle of insertion is decreased significantly. Okay. So the joint angle will determine the, the angle of insertion. Does that make sense to all of you? Okay, why are we talking about that? The reason is this. The, in this case, the bone will rotate that way, up and down. Therefore, because there is a rotationary force, the effective force of the muscle will actually create a muscle torque or a muscle moment. Torque and moment are words that are used interchangeably. And actually, what we see is the effects of that muscle moment causing the limb to rotate about an axis of rotation. Feel free to ask the person next to you if you're not here. Melanie. What's your or sign? Ah, that's the moment arm. So you. Oh, moment arm. Yes. Distance 
from the full group, which is this point, and the first line of action, which essentially is that. Yet the line that contains the force vector. And what is the distance between them? It's just that. So the moment term is this distance from the joint to the force line of action. Yes? And what happens to this moment term if this angle here increases? If the joint angle increases, the moment arm will decrease. Yes? If the moment arm decreases, what happens to the torque? Assuming we maintain the same force, there is less torque. So as the joint angle increases, the muscle produces less torque, or you could say it's less effective, causing rotation. Does that make sense? Or not? Yep, I'm just going to draw it so we actually can see it. If the joint angle increases, <coughs> the moment arm will significantly decrease. And therefore, the torque decreases. That is to say that even if the muscle produces the same force, the joint angle will determine how effective that force is in causing rotation. Which also means that by altering joint position, you can get a muscle to work less or to work more. To give you an example, if I am holding a weight on my arm, assume, let's just make the assumption, although we you know it is not true, this glass case weighs 10 kilograms. If I have this elbow stretched that way, compared to my elbow at this angle, in which position would my biceps have to work the hardest to maintain that horizontal? That way. Because the joint angle is increased, the moment arm is decreased, therefore the muscle force has to increase in order to maintain that. I would make it easy for myself if I bring this to this increased joint angle. Does that make sense? So altering the joint angle <coughs> does result in various level of muscle activation depending on what is what you do. And that's one aspect of technique. Good technique would be the one that actually minimizes muscle force by manipulating the set of joint angles to make it easier and therefore more effective. Does that make sense? <coughs> so ideally, you would like a muscle to have an increased moment arm. You are being a bit too loud and it's distracting. So, in order to increase this moment arm, the muscle will have to increase its insertion point, generally speaking. And that is important for us to consider, and we will see that a bit later on. Uh, I'm sure you know this. I'm just <coughs> thinking about that because it's a good uh, element to make this point stronger. Do you guys understand why is it good for us to have a kneecap? Yes. You probably have seen that. Why is it? Because it does increase the moment time. Does that make sense or no? Yes or no? Yeah. So you have a kneecap, so that's a femur, kneecap in front, tibia. By having this kneecap in front, increases the moment arm of that muscle. 
if, need, if this data wasn't there, the muscle will run flatter, it will have less momentum. So increasing the momentum indeed makes the job of the muscle more effective. And that's one of the reasons why we have a data set. The data will really increase that momentum. Good, so can we move on then? So let's have this ideal situation, it's not real, but let's have that for the sake of argument. So you have a muscle in front of a joint, causing this to rotate that way, flexion. You might want to think this as the elbow joint. This is not really, but you might want to think as a sort of biceps that flexes it. <coughs> and say so you have another muscle that will cause extension. So you can call this muscle a flexor. And you can call this muscle a extensor. When the flexor muscle is active, it causes a flexion motion, and it also causes a flexion moment or flexion torque. So it will be Sensor muscle is active, it will, call, it will cause an extension motion and what? An extension motion. Extension motion. Yep. That, that in this case will be clockwise. Are we okay with this? Okay. Let's just look at a simple flexion. So what, what kind of motion am I create am I performing here? Flexion, yeah? What kind of moment is causing that? Flexion moment, yeah. I did I presented this to you on purpose because I would mess up your heads a bit. Um, flexion moment causes a flexion <coughs> motion, correct? In how many stages can you divide, can you split this simple action? Three. Or is it just one action? Start and end. Can you break it down into the stages or do you think it's just one? The moment arm's constantly changing throughout yeah. the range. Okay, I will ask you this differently. What is the velocity of the arm at this point in time? Zero. 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 Okay. What is the velocity of the arm at this point in time? Zero. 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 When is the velocity maximum? Mm -hmm. in the Somewhere in between. Yep, say the middle. So what is the arm doing from this zero velocity <coughs> to maximum velocity? Accelerating. It's accelerating, correct? What is the velocity of the arm going from this maximum velocity to zero? Aha, uh -huh. so we have two phases, yeah? An acceleration phase and a phase of negative acceleration. Correct? Yes? Good. Bear with me. If the arm is accelerating in this way, which muscle group is dominating? The flexor. The flexor muscle. If the arm is having a negative acceleration from this point to the stop, which muscle group is Still dominating? Still the flexor. Yes. 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 Oh. Does that make sense? So you have, yes? It doesn't make sense because today in my anatomy tube, I said that and 
they say it wasn't right. Can you uh, explain? That's you? besides the point. Does this make sense to you? From what <laughs> first you point makes sense, but yeah. the second one doesn't. Ah, uh, no, that, that's I cannot. Uh, why is it why is it extensor when going up? Okay, okay. That's my question. Yeah, no, no. Okay, now I'm asking this. Don't don't get it too sexy. Just keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what to believe anymore. No, no, don't believe. <laughs> Makes sense for you, don't believe. I could be telling you if you have to. I just want you to follow the logic. So we have acceleration, yeah. which means that the biceps, so to speak, is winning over the triceps. Yeah, it's accelerating. From this point, it's slowing down to stop. Mm -hmm. Who is winning? The triceps. Extensor. Extensor, yeah. Correct? Yes. So that means that the action here is predominantly a flexion action. Okay. And from this point, even though the motion is flexion, yeah. what is dominant is the extension. Extensor muscle or activated on this phase. Pardon me? So on this phase, the extensor muscle are activated more than the flexor. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Is it activated more? As soon as it starts to accelerate, yes. or only once it stops, like it would be activated. Yeah, from this point, we will start to activate more and win over it in order to stop it. I yes. Thought it wouldn't stop it until it's more activated. What's on the sliding filament theory? Okay, we'll get to it. Yeah. I know how to yeah, can track so much. Can't get trapped by the motion. Yes? So, like, the once it goes past the middle, it's still like motion. So, do we still put like flexion motion, but extension for the moment? Yes. Okay. Now, I understand you guys completely. So, you want to have a chat about that? That's fine. I have to wait. No, no, honestly, if you want to chat about that, do chat about it. I think it's, it's important for you guys to chat. Oh, how's your day? Oh, so, I like extensors. Do you like flexors more or extensors more? Depends on what like, proposing it's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
moment, which is a fixed value, say 20, the graph will be exactly the same as that, but bigger. Does that make sense? It will just be like that. <coughs> which makes the point. When the torque is positive, we are facing a flex of torque. And when the torque is negative, we are facing an extensor torque.
be simply because it has a greater moment arm. Yeah? Now let's have another situation. We have a muscle that crosses two joints. Okay, there, it goes and wraps around and becomes a here. So let's call this joint one and let's call that joint two. So this muscle, whichever this muscle is, will cause flexion at joint one and will cause extension at joint two. Would this be would this muscle be a better flexor of joint one or a better extensor of joint two? It will be a better extensor of joint two because it will have greater moment arm. Yeah? on the basis of a longer insertion point. Again, this is simplified. It's not meant to be realistic. I just want to stress the fact that muscles would have a particular function depending on where they insert. Or to say it differently, depending on their functions, muscles have a set insertion point that makes them more prone or able to carry out their functions based on that. So what would happen if we make this a bit sexier and have same joint one, joint two, insertion here, and insertion down there, joint one, joint two, and say let's have insertion here and insertion there. So let's call this muscle A and this muscle B. What do you think would happen? A would be a better knee extensor or better extension of two than being a flexor of joint one. B would be a better extensor of joint one and a poor flexor of joint two. Again, based on the insertion point. Could the hamstrings be a hip flexor? Could I ask you this again? 
If I activate the hamstrings, could I flex my hip? Yes. The question is plain and simple. If the hamstrings is not a hip flexor, then activating it should not result in a hip flexion. But some of you say that yes, it does result in a hip flexion. Can the gluteus maximus be a plantar flexor? No. Hmm? You laugh? <laughs> That's impossible. Yes? Are you with him? Okay. Good. In a way, says that the gluteus maximus, it might not be anatomically a big uh, angle plantar flexor, but functionally it is. Yeah. By function, because you activate this, and assuming you have nothing else but a string here, you can cause plantar flexion by activating this muscle. And that is a wonder of the human body. It actually is wonderful. You don't activate a muscle that will cause motion elsewhere. This indeed explains, if you are to think, why when we jump, we jump with the legs fully extended. Otherwise, if it wasn't because of this, it wouldn't make sense. The reason why I say it wouldn't make sense is because if you think of the jumping task, what you have, say, just to make it simple, just the knee joint, stretching out. The stretching out angular velocity of the knee is zero at the time of taking off, which doesn't make sense. You should be taking off when your knee's extension is at maximum velocity. But you do take off when your knee extension velocity is zero. And the reason why we do that is because we can still use this energy that is transferred by a series of connections that I'll talk to you in a second to the plantar flexion. So in that sense it is still is effective for us to take off with the knee fully extended because we can still use this energy that is sent to the plantar flexion. And 
that is because of one single thing. We do have muscles that cross two joints. That is, we have muscles that are called biarticular muscles. And these guys are actually fundamental to do what we do. Essentially what they do, they transfer the energy between joints that is produced elsewhere. And in doing so, contribute greatly to the interjoint coordination. If it wasn't because of these biarticular muscles, we could not coordinate the motion side of the hip and the knee and the ankle. They are connected by this series of biarticular muscles. In the case of the knee and the hip, we have the rectus pectoris which does that function. We have the hamstrings, which also do that function. That function, sorry. And on the leg, we have the gastrocnemius. It is because of these three guys that the energy produced elsewhere can be redistributed. And in doing so, we coordinate joint action. Yes? Question. Do you know how you said, like, the point by the top A, that would affect down the bottom? Yeah. So if down the bottom was, like, stiff or tight, Sorry, can, can you try again? I lost you. Sorry. Point down the bottom, so the gastroenterologist, if they were stiff or tight, that would affect them up as well. Do you get what I'm saying? You said like the glutes would affect. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, minimize if, the force. If this will, stiff, will be, if this gastro will be stiff, uh, because it's pulled up, it will just result in this. Yeah. If, if it doesn't allow that, it will reduce the force of that. There will be a waste of energy. Really. I need to think of to understand fully what you're asking. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, well, well, yeah that's right. it's good that you asked. Yeah, that's what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think what the mechanism would be for it to be reversible. And no, I don't think it is because this is the basis as to why we move from proximal to distal. Does that make sense or not? We first of all move the trunk, then the side, then the leg, and at the end the foot. From the largest to the smallest. Does that make sense? It is because we transfer energy from the largest to the smallest. I don't think the smallest can actually send energy to the largest. Yes. Would you say how what has the ability to stretch the squat? Ah, you will reduce how much you move, yes. But it won't transfer energy out. Yeah, that's what I Yeah. Okay. Now the point of coordination, I think it's important for you guys to try to remain engaged. Um, if you wouldn't have by particular muscles, <coughs> some of the tasks that we do take for granted will be nearly impossible. For instance, one is standing up. So I could be squatting down and then stand up. If we wouldn't have the set of particular muscles, that wouldn't happen. That would be impossible. For instance, if you describe um, the action of standing up, comprises of what? Knee extension. And what? Say main, mainly knee extension and hip extension. Yeah? If I were to have biarticular muscles, if I am in this position, knee extension would be that. And then hip extension would be that. Does that make sense? But because we have them, these two things can happen at the same time. Because we have a set of biarticular muscles crossing the front part you have a set of biarticular muscles crossing the back part that enable us to have this coordinated action. Back in the late 90s, when robotics started to grow, that was one of the problems they had with building up robots. Because back then, they used to have one engine for each joint. But there was no way of communicating the two engines 
have two different joints and they have robots doing exactly that instead of having biarticular engines that could coordinate the two. Now, based on this simple concept, that has been implemented and developed to the point that we can have now robots that, that work perfectly fine. So biarticular muscles are, are wonderful units. They have the main characteristic that the length of them does not change as much as the length of muscles that cross one joint. If we think of the lower limbs, the typical muscle that cross one joint is obviously are the gluteus maximus, the vasti, soleus, tibialis anterior, and so forth. They only cross one joint, while we have the biarticular muscles crossing two joints. If you look at your data um, from last week, depending on the action that you have collected data from, biarticular muscles will tend to have uh, lesser strain than the monoarticular muscles because they do change length less than the uh, monoarticular muscles. One property that is important for us to distinguish between these two muscle groups <coughs> is associated with the length changes they undergo during normal contraction or normal function. And the importance of this uh, length change is because of the force length and force velocity relationship, which I believe you know already. So I want to spend time talking about that, um, just as a matter of keeping it consistent. For length, you will have that there is an optimal length at which maximum force is attained, and you will also have the force velocity relationship, whereby the faster the contraction velocity is, the less um, force can be produced and the opposite. Okay, so I take this for granted. You know this. If a biarticular muscle length doesn't change as much that means that they are able to operate most of the time within this band. They don't lengthen as much, they don't shorten as much. They will be operating in the vicinity of the optimal length. And therefore, they are more efficient doing what they do. Likewise, if biarticular muscles length doesn't change as much, the lengthening and shortening, shortening velocity of them does not increase either, which means that they will be operating on the lower end of shortening and lengthening velocity, mm -hmm. that is where uh, their maximum force is attained. That makes them efficient and suited for what they do. You that? Yeah. Yes. Again, I'll start from here. If um, biarticular muscle length doesn't change as much, because while they are shortening one joint, they will be lengthening on the other, that length doesn't change as much, they are suited to work in the vicinity of the optimal length, because the length doesn't change as much. And because of the length doesn't change as much, the lengthening and shortening velocity is in that break. And because of that, they are operating on this region of the force velocity relationship, which makes them efficient for what they do. That, of course, is in contrast to what happens to muscles that cross one joint. Think of the vasti. If you flex a knee, then they will stretch. That's it. There is nothing at the hip that could compensate for that stretch. So those muscles are likely to operate in the entire spectrum of the force-length relationship. And because 
also touch on the entire spectrum of the force velocity relationship. Does, does that mean that the um, muscle that's inhibiting one sort of motion in the um, in the biarticular muscle needs to produce a lot of force to inhibit that other motion? <coughs> Do you know what I'm saying? No, no, sorry. So let's say. Uh, let's just let's, yeah. So let's say uh, the rectus femoral is trying to inhibit uh, knee and uh, so flexion. Yeah. Um, would it take a lot of force to do that because of the, uh, the fact that the opposing muscle is acting in F max for a long time? Consistently? Yeah. yeah, that's part of, this is part of the equation because the rectus femoris is not a strong muscle. Yeah. Doesn't, and that's um, something we'll discuss next. They do not produce, they are not like the gluteus maximus. They just essentially, they have a function to transfer energy, but they do not produce the energy. So they are not strong as such. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, um, and I will just take that question as the introduction for the next point. Uh, because uh, of here, because of this, we have set <coughs> two scenarios. <coughs> in this example that I have given you, the gluteus maximus would be the muscle that is in charge of producing energy or power or moment, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing really. And that energy would be distributed between joints by the role of biarticular muscles, which essentially is to transfer energy between joints. So what we can say from here is that both articular muscles, and the joint side model, they are essentially energy producing muscles. And by articular muscle is an output. By arc. They are energy distributing muscles. <coughs> so the onus of producing energy is on the monoarticular muscles. They are the guys that are to be strong. And indeed they are. <coughs> Because of what we have said last week, monoarticular um, muscles, that they are the energy producing muscles, they will tend to have a greater proportion of fast pitch muscle fibers. <coughs> and because of this role of energy distributing, they have lesser fast pitch than the monoarticular muscles. It is not to say that they are uh, slow, it's just to say that they have less than the monoarticular muscles because of that role. Because of that role too, <coughs> um, when someone engages in strength training, the muscle group that responds quickest and more efficiently, efficiently to the adaptation of the stress are the monoarticular muscles. You might see someone doing bench press, you will see these humanus pecs. You might see someone doing sprint, you will see these humanus uh, gluteus maximus, these humanus uh, vastus medialis and lateralis, and so forth. Rarely you will see someone that is this humanus rectus humanus. Uh, what happens is if someone engages in strength training, these guys will actually adapt more rapidly than these guys. And they will develop more mass quickly. Added to it is the fact that not so much now, but in a couple, five years ago, most of the training was focused on concentric training, which will favor the function in training of this guy. Which typically, because these guys, sorry, because these guys <coughs> are in terms of the energy produced by these guys, if these guys are massive and these aren't as much, they will tend to give way by the amount of energy that they have to transfer. And it is no surprise that most of the non-contact injuries to the lower limb are to which muscle? Hamstrings, right thumb, which are by articular muscles, if that makes sense. I know that uh, there is this trend of functional training that accounts for not only 
only the muscle itself, but the function they play in a given activity, and therefore they facilitate the adaptation of this energy for these muscles as well as the adaptation of muscles that have the job of transferring that energy. Because this is not a strength training unit, I'm not good at it, so we will just mention that. Um, okay, so we have established that more articular muscles are stronger, they produce more power, and biarticular muscles are not necessarily that strong, but they have a particular function. Okay, so coupled with this is what we have mentioned before, I'm just going to bring it uh, about just to wrap up the point. Monarticular muscles tend to have thicker and shorter tendons that enable them, I mean the tendons, to transfer effectively the force that monarticular muscles produce. So they tend to be equipped with shorter and thicker tendons. that in nature are quite steep. And that makes sense because the energy that they transfer is transferred immediately to the bone they attach to. And biarticular muscles tend to have longer tendons. They are not as steep as the tendons are attached to monarchical muscles, and hence they, has the cap they have the capacity to store elastic energy. So there is this notion of storing elastic energy that indeed can help us to produce maximum force. And you can, I don't know whether I have used this example with you or not, probably not. And you can test that. We can store elastic energy in the tendons, um, especially the ones in the tendons that are the one. If you think of your pillow, you can test this. You can flick your finger as fast and as hard as you can without any resistance. Just do it by yourself and you will see how awkward that is. There is no much power. But if you have the thumb resisting it without letting it go, there is some elastic energy being stored in that tendon. If you let it go, you find that you are more strong doing that with that storage of elastic energy without it. Yes. Such, such effect, such effect, however, could not be found if you do it with a twice. This increase in energy on the extension of the finger, compared to nothing against that, you couldn't find if you do it with a quartz. The reason why that is is because we don't store as much elastic energy on the quads as we do here. And the reason why that is because we have <coughs> longer tendons here than we do on the quads. So the mass or the ratio in between muscle belly and tendon <coughs> determines that ability to store more or less elastic energy. If you have a larger muscle belly and less tendon, you tend to store less elastic energy. But if you have less muscle belly, more tendon, then you have the ability to store more 
elastic energy. And that is why, to, as we have mentioned in the past, <coughs> any average dog will jump higher than the best trained athlete. Because those animals have larger range of muscle to tendon. Than they, do. they have more tendon than muscle compared to us. So that makes them more suited for power production. <coughs> If you are a bit less noisy out there, please, guys. Right. Thank you. Um, are you okay? Are you having fun? Yeah. <coughs> um, the other thing that comes with it is that if you rely more on the storage of elastic energy than the actual muscle production, for, muscle produced force to do whatever you do, your actions are more stereotypical. They are more similar, more equal. And that, in turn, limits the ability to do a variety of actions. Does that make sense? Or not? So a, a, a dog will jump so high most of the time, equal. You can control how much you jump. You have that ability to control what you do. Your action is known as stereotypical, because you have more muscle, which means you have more motor units and more control of what you do. That is what gives us, um, that's a trade off. We are more versatile, uh, less powerful though, but we are more versatile, able to do many things with the same system. So again, it's very important to consider the ratio of muscle belly to tendon. That ratio is determined by the muscle function and that ratio determines how much elastic energy you can store. I will give you a quick presentation of what uh, a muscle model is in order for us to discuss the next and final point of today's lecture. I, I can see you're a bit restless, but I really want to be here. Do you need a break? Yes. yes. Yeah, take a break. <laughs> Guys, guys, in general, muscle is made up of something like that. You have passive tissue, say tendon, uh, the fibers of the myofibrils of the muscle tissue are enveloped by the endomysium, paradisium, and all the mysiums you can think of. This passive tissue that envelops the muscles, yeah? keeps them together, even at gross muscle level, and bundles of fibers, fibers and myofibrils. So we have passive tissue um, that goes side and side with the muscle fibers, and we also obviously have the muscle fibers, of which the smallest component is the sarcomere. The muscle tissue or the muscle tendon complex is made up of primarily of these three types of elements that we have identified. Uh, tendon, by which the force is transferred to the bone, the muscle fibers, which are the elements that produce the force uh, in the muscle tissue, and the passive tissue that envelops those. Uh, in Biomechanics, we like to make things simple, although it looks the opposite, but in reality we, did, we do like to make things simple and easy to understand. And for that reason, we use models instead of working with the actual uh, issue. One such model that uh, represents or <coughs> the muscle tendon 
complex is the one that I will present to you. We conceptualize the mass of tendon complex as being made up of three elements, the ones that I have just mentioned. There. These two points represent the origin and the insertion points of the muscle. We have on the one hand the unit that produces the force, which is what we call the contractile element of the muscle tissue. In parallel with it, we have the parallel elastic components, which again represents the passive tissue that envelopes the contractile element or the muscle fibers. And in series, we have the series of elastic components, which primarily, not uniquely, but represent the tendon tissue. And we use this simple model to make a few discussions, and that's what we will conduct in the next minute. To make that discussion, we will have assumed that this muscle will contract uh, <coughs> isometrically. That is, there won't be a length change of the whole thing. So I will just come back to the next page. Again, I'm just going to draw that. Contract of the mesh, the series of elastic components. Sorry, parallel elastic components. My apologies. And here we have the series of elastic components. And we are assuming that we are going to deal with an isometric contraction. That is, we are assuming that the length from the origin point to the insertion point, that length, does not change. Are you okay with that? That length doesn't change. Say this contraction is just for the sake of the example, a maximal contraction, that is, the guy or the girl is exerting as much as they can possibly do. A question for you is, what happens to the length of the contractile element when such contraction occurs? It will shorten. Yes? If the contraction is taking place <coughs> isometrically, this length will shorten. That's the only thing it can do by itself. So this length will shorten, and so will the parallel elastic component because it is em enveloping it. Yep. So we have the same length, but this length here shortens. Which means that the series of elastic components That's what? Lengthen. Stretches, yeah? The series of elastic component stretches. The more activation takes place at the contractile element, the greater the lengthening of this series of elastic component is. If you relax this, that length will go back to normal. Yes, it will stretch even under isometric contraction. Yeah. And if the amount of stretch that you can subject a series of elastic components does depend on how active the muscle is. Okay, what that means is this. Say you have this scenario <coughs> where the contractile element is activated maximally, which means that the series of elastic components will be stretched significantly. Uh, because this is a series of elastic 
components. What does an elastic do when it's stretched? Stores elastic energy. Yes? Yes or no? So if you activate a contractile element under isometric contractors, you will store elastic energy on the series of elastic components. Which means that you could theoretically reutilize this energy if the ball actually is followed by a concentric contraction. Yes? So the more active this is, the more elastic energy can be stored and the more can be used subsequently. <coughs> Which means that in terms of power production, training the athlete to achieve maximum active state is fundamental. Because that ensures that there is plenty of energy stored there. If this activation is poor, then there is not much energy stored here, but this, if this act activation is maximal, then there is maximal storage of elastic energy. Does that make sense? Can you imagine what would happen during an eccentric contraction? The series of elastic components, if they consent, if the contraction is isometric, the whole thing would lengthen, wouldn't it? Yep? Or not? If it is an eccentric contraction, so the distance between the origin and the insertion will increase, which means that there is potentially more elastic energy to be stored in that situation. Does that make sense? And if the muscle is maximally active, that storage will increase it. Does that make sense? Christina, does that make sense to you? Yes, can you explain that fact to me? No, I know, I know, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Again, if the contraction is eccentric, that distance in between the origin and the insertion will increase, which in turn will mean that the series of elastic component will increase, which in turn means that there will be greater elastic energy stored in that unit. Which means that stretching a muscle before it's shortened should result in a greater power output. Does that refer back to the starting question? I just can't remember the terms of it. Where at the end part of the concentric contraction, eccentrically, the triceps working more. So is that sort of on that same path? Where as you go through that eccentric movement and it's lengthening and storing energy, it's it's further activated. The further or the deeper into the contraction you get. Oh, I know what you're saying. Yes, it doesn't yeah. turn back to it. Okay, guys, please stay with me. <coughs> There's plenty more to do, but I'm just uh, about to finish so you guys get something out of this. Again, if you have an eccentric contraction, that ensures that you store more elastic energy. And if that eccentric contraction is followed by a concentric contraction, then the power output increases because of the stored elastic energy. Yes. So if you were to say if you were to extend your bicep, would it be easier to contract it again if you've gone all the way down as opposed to if you stopped here and decided to come back up? Yes, if you can do it, but don't do it with weights. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the best example to what I'm saying is the counter movement jump. When you do the counter movement, what is what you are doing? Storing energy. You are stretching the quads, and by this theory, you are stretching elastic. You are storing elastic energy, there, and that is utilized on the concentric. <coughs> and typically, most people will jump higher doing this than just doing that because they have that advantage of storage of elastic energy. And that is what we call. And you will see this, the stretch and shorten of the cycle. And we will continue on this next week. Are you happy for this to be? I thought you would be sad.